Congratulations with your book. Uh, it's awaited here in Ukraine. And I know your research, your first book was about Russia, but then you spent a lot of time in Ukraine. And of course, propaganda and the disinformation is the place to research. However, you start your book not in Ukraine, but you travel to Philippines, you travel to other countries. And when I was reading as a Ukrainian this book, I thought like, wow, there are the places where things are worse. Is it really the case? <laughs> And like, what, what is the most important now at this, at this uh, type, time of the recent war? We are living with the five year, already for five years with the whole discussion about the fake news and propaganda. So in the Philippines, they would tell me that at least it's not as bad here as Russia and Ukraine. Uh, and they saw, you know, uh, they actually, in, tr in, in terms of trying to understand what's happening in the Philippines, they looked at Russia and Ukraine a lot, actually, to try to make sense of what was going on there. So I think everybody sees um, not just, you know, that hell is somewhere else. Um, but what was interesting in the book was trying to understand whether the phenomena that I'd seen in Russia, whether they were similar across the world. And, and they are. I mean, it's surprising how similar the propaganda crisis or the crisis in dealing with propaganda is everywhere. And Russia was one of the first places to figure this out for reasons that I explore in the book. Um, but really, the, the, there's three or four key, key kind of themes. One of them is technical, uh, which is that nowadays censorship doesn't happen through trying to squeeze information but by overloading people with so much disinformation and bots and trolls and fake news that they can't see truth from fiction anymore and they can't talk to each other and they can't trust each other. And the really important thing about that is that that's, you know, the excuse to do that sort of propaganda, propaganda through noise, is freedom of expression. You know, I've heard this over and over and over from propagandists across the world, this is just freedom of expression. And when, even when it's used to harass or bully or intimidate or alienate critics or dissidents or journalists, they don't really have an argument against it. Because you know, the argument of pro-democracy activists has always been we need more freedom of expression. And here the regime goes, what can we do? You, know, you can't prove that it's the government behind these campaigns most of the time. These are just concerned citizens who don't agree with your position. And but when you were talking to some people, there was some evidence that those who are kind of organizing some trolls, that they are connected. So these are, we have the reason to say that these are not just concerned citizens. Sure, How but, to work with that? Sure, but proving the connections even between Prigozhin and the Kremlin is very difficult, even though that's a, you know, it's a pretty clear case. In other countries, the connection is even more loose. You know, it can be just uh, a little, you know, it can be PR companies with a, you know, off the books uh, operation that does this sort of work. Finding the kind of the paper trail is very hard. But secondly, what are they doing wrong? If it's not death threats, which is then hate speech, if they're just saying, you know, you're terrible, you're terrible, we don't believe you, we don't trust you, you're biased. I mean, what's, I mean, that's still speech. That's still political speech. That's not death threats. When it goes into, uh, over into death threats, then it's somewhat something else. But in America, you'd have to prove that the death threats were actually going to be acted upon before they become illegal. But then where Russia comes here, because you said that there is something you've seen whether this technology is used all over the place, all over the world. So no. what was mm. there? What, what Russia invented in this case? Well, actually, when we talk about the early, all the early studies of kind of censorship through noise and troll farms, the first one was actually made in, about Russia. A citizen lab, a Canadian outfit, analyzed Russia and sort of like, I can't remember, it must have been 2010, 2011, and said, oh, wow, is this something we're going to be seeing in other places? So Russia was quite an innovator in that sense. But no, I think on an even deeper level, um, propaganda that is not based on ideological principles and not trying to convince people of anything, but just trying to confuse them. So cynicism, that was something that was sort of pioneered in Russia to a huge amount in the 90s and early 2000s, which was what my first book was about. This kind of sense that uh, nothing is true uh, and sort of wild relativism. Russia was probably the first one to co-opt that approach. Um, and also this kind of attitude where the facts don't matter, that we see so much in Trump today or in Duterte. Um, that's something that we saw in Russia already in the early 90s with Zhirinovsky, in many ways as a prototype for all these 
all these politicians. Um, you interviewed a journalist who made this investigation being an insider on the Trolls factory. And what I understood, you were um, interested that she was disappointed with the results of the reaction on the reaction of her findings, that she uncovered those world of trolls, but neither the society nor even the Western authorities didn't really react. Yeah, so this is uh, Lyudmila Savchuk, who's an incredibly brave journalist who went inside the troll factories and really provided a lot of our evidence about how they work. Yeah, I mean, I interviewed her when her story was already well known. And really, I was writing about what she'd experience after that, because she thought she'd do this investigative journalism, show the truth to people, and there would be so much public outrage that these places would shut down. Plus, there would be legal measures. And instead, she found people just shrugged, said, yeah, this is normal, this is just what happens, this is the reality we live in, and just accepted it, which she thought terrible. And then secondly, even when the Russian troll factories operation in America was discovered, the Americans took very, very little legal action. And I talked to lawyers in Washington, like, why didn't you put sanctions on people who work at the troll factory? They're like, we can't sanction people for freedom of speech. What they could do is get them for using false documents, yeah? like little legal problems, yeah? opening fake bank accounts, which they've done in America. You could get them for that, but you couldn't really get them on freedom of speech issues. So that was, you know, there isn't even kind of a, a regulatory framework to approach these things. We also discussed earlier with you that there is some difference, though Ukraine is the place on the forefront on, uh, of an avant-garde of all those movements regarding the weaponization of information. However, it differs from the West because here there is an actual war, uh, which luckily we don't have elsewhere in other countries or in the West. Uh, yet, what is today you see the main things in Ukraine, in Ukraine as an opportunity to I won't say answer Russian propaganda, but kind of find the way to overcome all those problems which are coming to the country with the disinformation, with all the troubles, all these problems you are writing, uh, bringing to the societies. So what's the question? So uh, you look at the Ukrainian yeah. cases. So why, what, 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 can you explain as well to our audience yeah. what makes Ukraine as well unique okay. at the same time where the things Ukraine also may reconsider how to answer the, all the troubles of the Russian propaganda? Well, listen, I mean, the challenge in Ukraine, as everybody here knows, is that there's sort of a Russian propaganda that comes from the Kremlin through Russian TV channels and through social media. I mean, that's partly been dealt with due to, you know, harsh, but I think probably justified bans on Russian media. But then you just have a lot of powerful oligarchs in the country who might as well be, you know, proxies of the Kremlin. So that's what makes the situation here so hard. And, you know, that's something that's a systemic problem, which I don't quite understand how, how that's going to be dealt with. I mean, I know how I would deal with it, um, but I don't see those kind of mechanisms being available in Ukraine. Um, but uh, so there's that, and that's kind of a, a deeper systemic problem. Um, but what this last election has shown is that actually it is possible to break through the polarization in the country that the Kremlin tried to take advantage of and that politicians here have tried to take advantage of, which is sort of splitting the country into two. There are ways around that. There are ways to find commonalities between different groups of people. How deep those commonalities go, we have to explore. Um, and I don't think political campaigns are going to be the ones that do this in the most socially beneficial way. I think that's up to media and public service broadcasting to do. But it was refreshing. I mean, it showed that a lot of these kind of crude divisions that we draw around Ukraine, they weren't necessarily true. Uh, while you're also looking a lot at the West, that uh the um, say dark forces uh, like the radicals, far right, and the others, and also the organization like um, ISIS, they you they became very good and powerful in creating this idea of majority and 
whom do they appeal uh, com compared to the other, let's say, democratic forces. And this is also connected to the way some of the Russian uh, spin doctors worked in early 90s. So can you explain, elaborate more on this idea? How are they working and what answers are lacking? <laughs> So what was fascinating for me was talking to Russian propagandists from the 90s, talking to propagandists in America uh, who do kind of like, and, and Latin America who do mainstream elections, and talking to people who work to counter ISIS or are from the far right, it was how similar all the avant-garde of propaganda is. And it's usually the bad guys who do this best because they're good at sniffing out advantage. Instead of a top-down ideological diktat, they look at society, they see how social roles have broken down, social media allows you to target very small groups in very targeted ways. One propagandist told me you need around 70 messages for a country of 20 million. You target them with completely different messages, but because you've targeted them with different messages, you can't put them together into one ideology, so you unite them around a vague feeling. Take back control, you know, the Islamic states, you know, the, 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 sort of the feeling of a pristine Islamic state somewhere. Um, make Russia great again, make America great again. These sort of vague feelings and a very vague, fluffy, amorphous idea of the people, the many, the majority, the ummah. So it's the creation, or what we call populism, is the creation of the sense of a people for a very short-term aim. And these coalitions always break apart very, very quickly. So I kind of you expect that with a Trump or a five-star in Italy. It was very interesting seeing how, in the 1990s, uh, Russian propagandists were thinking about this. But when I talk to the far right, or what we think of as the far right still, just about, that's how they work as well. They will reach out to very, very different campaigns. People who are um, from what's called the manosphere, so people who are against women, against feminism. Feminists who are anti-Islam, because Islam uh, is, uh, you know, doesn't, doesn't take into account the rights of women. Um, people who want to build an all-white Europe, or Brexiteers who want to break apart Europe. So very, very, very different groups, and they find something very vague that unites all of them. You know, um, a hatred of foreigners, or Brussels, or the elite, or the globalists, or some sort of very vague enemy, and a very vague sense of the people. And what's interesting is these far-right campaigns break apart again. You know, they, they come together for one rush you know, to support the AFD in Germany during a European election, or to try to do a campaign against um, immigration or something. But then they break apart again. You know? And this is actually the rhythm of all these sort of creations of identity in the modern world. You, they gather very quickly and then they fall apart again. We're talking a lot now about like how Russia um, influence with all what you just mentioned, maybe the public sphere and all this uh, um, new tools, um, we, we're speaking about the ISIS or Duterte. At the same time, some things which had been created, been created in the UK, for instance, the, the organization like Cambridge Analytics, uh, and you've been in the Parliament Commission to look at the case. So what was, was also, can you describe what you found out while talking to those people who were um, not some other people from dictatorships? Well, Cambridge Analytica were an, elect, an election management company, a PR company, basically, that actually worked with quite a lot of nasty regimes uh, in order to do political campaigns. They actually weren't very successful, and their claim to fame was that they had worked on Trump's campaign and that they had discovered something they called psychographics, their secret magic source, that allowed them to analyze someone's Facebook likes and to see into their deeper subconscious and get them to make for trouble. I actually interviewed the guy who created the company that was the parent company to Cambridge Analytica, who's a guy who spent 20, 30 years researching what is influence, what is behavioral change. Not attitudinal change, but actually getting people to do something, whether it's to stop smoking or to vote for Trump. And after decades of research, he's developed a very complex methodology, which he thinks is as close as you can get to effective in the sphere, and people who work for him say it's, it's, it's a good methodology. I mean, nothing in influence is that scientific, but this is as close as you can get. 
But his methodology requires anthropological research of communities, not just sociology, but embedding people in communities to ask questions which people don't even realize are questions to really understand what motivates them and what are the group dynamics. It's, very, very, it's a lot of pages. It's very, very slow. It's very, very expensive. Um, and, and you know, most political campaigns don't have the time or the money to do this sort of research. So um, Cambridge Analytica basically said, took his theories and said you could replicate that by analyzing Facebook likes. He thinks this is nonsense. He thinks they took his ideas and just, you know, they were essentially propagandizing themselves. What they were very good at is finding potential audiences that might vote for Trump. And you can do that through Facebook technology, through lookalike audiences. If you know what are the parameters of a Trump voter, you can find other voters around America yeah, who might fit the same parameters. So that's finding new audiences. That is very useful. And that, that means you can get a few extra voters somewhere. But their big claim of being able to read society's mind is probably hocus pocus. If to be very short, what would be your major um, recommendation for the governments, for the governments like ours, for the governments in the West, who are talking a lot about the freedom of press and informational security, uh, but also like the big, big media, like thinking and public broadcasting or, and the role of journalism? So regulation is coming to the information space. There's a way of making that regulation democratic, though. I think the regulation has to be not about censoring content, but about opening up the information space so we understand how the information around environment around us is created. That means opening up the algorithms so companies have to do reports that show why people see certain bits of information, not other bits of information. That means understanding anything that you see online, why you see it, who's behind it, whether it's organic or uh, organic or amplified, whether it's a bot or a real person, so that we can start to communicate with the information of around, environment around us as equals. Yeah? And the dictators will hate that because they want to make the internet as muddy and as untransparent as possible. And they certainly don't want to open up you know, the algorithms of, of you know, the Chinese Weibo system or whatever, or the Chinese internet. So I think there's a way of stand, staying within the principles of freedom of expression, which is also the right to receive information. Uh, but to completely change the environment that we operate in and maybe making some forms of covert uh, activity illegal, yeah, because it's not within those rules of transparency. For media, look, media basically has lost. Uh, if media's mission was to be people's defender vis-a-vis -vis government, a lot of people don't feel they do that anymore. They don't feel media is useful. Um, and media was also, or a certain amount of media was meant to create a kind of a common discourse in a country. Certainly public service media has that as part of its mission. And they're really struggling to do that. So I think we're gonna to have to create a new type of body, um, something between civil society and media, whose job it is to actually be useful to people, so people feel that they are being represented and helped by them, and to bring different groups together so that we have a common public discourse. But I don't know whose job that is. It could be your job. Could be, uh, should be, maybe. Your book, my, my final question about that book is also personal. It's a bio, uh, you're, you're telling the story of your family which had to move from Ukraine, also from Kiev, from Chernivtsi, uh, to first uh, the UK, to uh, your father worked at uh, BBC uh, in London and then later Radio Free uh, Europe, Radio Liberty. But you're also writing about yourself and finding this identity, your identity is like, so uh, while writing this book and while thinking about that, uh, it was interesting for me how you mentioned that all of a sudden you've been British, but not really British when you were a kid, but now it's very clear that you are kind of representative of this elite in the UK. So um, what is your identity? Have you found your identity, also a Ukrainian identity, while writing this book and doing all this research? So listen, I mean, the, the, my identity is in there only to talk about the greater theme. This is, this is a family memoir which I use as a device in order to explore themes around propaganda. And propaganda is, at the end of the day, about identity. It's not about bots and trolls. The stuff that you and I have been talking about is really the most superficial part of propaganda. The kind of like, you know, uh, sadly all the focus is on that. But, but really, propaganda on a deep level is about creating identities for political use. So 
the story that I tell is that I, I myself, because of my various, you know, I've either always been an emigre or an immigrant all my life. I'm either emigrating from somewhere or immigrating to somewhere. And so I've always asked myself questions about identity. But now everybody is. That was the interesting thing for me, that I grew up with all these questions, but people had pretty stable identities, especially in England, which is always very stable. And now the English are having a massive nervous breakdown. They don't know who they are. They have these questions about the will of the people. They have no idea who the people are, let alone what its will is. Um, and now the English are going through these kind of like spasms of self-identity. And obviously that's a period when propagandists work a lot because they can reform and remold identity. And sadly, the way they do that is usually to create, you know, a sense of the people and the non-people, the enemy. And kind of my message in the book is that because I've always been questioning my identity, I've learned to treat identity quite lightly. Yeah. Uh, I'm quite privileged. I can slip into my Ukrainian identity, my English identity, my Jewish identity. And I find that a very enriching experience. And I don't need another to hate. And I think at the end of the day, the real resistance to this, whether you call it populism or political Islam does the same thing or the far right do the same thing. The real antidote to this model of creating another that you hate is helping people to live with comfort with multiple identities. Hopefully the book helps to do that.